I need a lot of accurate cuts on this project, so I'm going to check my saw blade. I've already tested, you've probably seen in a couple of previous inclinometer videos, that this blade is at right angles to the table that way. I now want to check that it's uh, parallel to the track here. So I'm going to raise it up to nearly its full height. I don't want to go right the way to the top because as you push into the end stop on the uh, height adjuster then it does move slightly. So I'm going to back off and then come back again. And I'm going to find a tooth that makes a moderate amount of noise against the plastic part of the mitre gauge here. That one. And I'm going to mark that tooth so I can find it again. Then I'll take that tooth over to the other side and I'll see what kind of noise it makes against the same plastic piece. And it's slightly louder which suggests a tiny bit of non-parallelism, but too tiny to worry about. So that's good. Next, the rip fence. I've moved the rip fence to the other side of the blade because I already know that this angle here is not 90 degrees and it's no particular problem, I'm not going to bother with that. Then I tapped and jiggled and waggled the fence and locked it down and then found a feeler blade against the same tooth, 0.07 of a millimetre it happens to be, such that it's the way I was taught to use a feeler gauge, you can just feel a slight tug on the blade from the gap. So I've moved the marked tooth over to the other side and I've put my feeler gauge in, which is a little bit more awkward as the riving knife gets in the way, but there is a slightly bigger gap there. So that's slightly disturbing news. It means that the workpiece as it's been sliding along the rip fence in the normal position has been pinching slightly, which also means every time I've elected to use the auxiliary fence, that was a good choice to have made. Anyway, I need to adjust it and that's rather irritating as it involves fiddling with these set screws here and I'm going to be ages doing that. First of all, they're extremely tight from the factory. I had to go before it undoing them, I gave up. And secondly, once you've undone them, doing them back up will create more of a disturbance than the gap I'm trying to correct. So I'm in for a great deal of fiddling. To make life a bit easier, I'm going to carry out the adjustment against the track here. Having already established that this track is parallel to the blade, and having verified looking down that I can actually see that discrepancy along this edge here, I'll make life easier by adjusting the rip fence to this line here. Well, that's done, and it wasn't too bad. I am feeling somewhat guilty that I haven't done it earlier, and I've allowed a pinch of the rip fence in toward the blade to persist. Anyway, the reason for wanting the precision is I'm going to be cutting a whole bunch of these that I want exactly the same size. It's approximately uh, 25 millimeter or an inch in width and approximately nine millimeters in thickness. Uh, some of which I'm going to leave as slats and some of which I'm going to chop up into one inch squares. And I want to assemble all the slats and the squares into little lattice shelves which I'm going to use for a paper tidy. I'm using a lattice partly to cut down on weight, partly to more effectively use up the waste, and partly to allow some light through so that I can see what papers are on the shelf underneath. It does mean though that everything has to be super square to all fit together properly. The key dimension is this one here. It's just under 25 millimeters and a little bit more under an inch. I'll be chopping it up like this, so these will actually be the top surfaces of the slats and squares. And I'll be duplicating this dimension here when I chop some of the slats up into those squares. They don't really have to be square, I guess, but it'll make life easier and probably look nicer. So roughly the elements of this are an inch or 25 millimeters, and I'm going for nine widthwise and 13 lengthwise. Nine across the width will give me enough to cover letter paper, which is wider in its width at eight and a half inches, and 13 for the length will amply give me enough for A4, which is longer than letter. A4 being 297 millimeters, and I'm going to get 325 if I have 13 units in the length. 
I'm also going to be using this piece here, which handily is just very slightly narrower and it might not be enough. I might have to make some more of this. And I want these, which are gonna form the jig elements to be slightly narrower than the main ones for reasons we shall see. I want to remove the rounded corners, so I'll just sight down here and move the blade to the end of that gap there. I spent a bit of time trying to guess where knots are going to break a slat in two, but <laughs> it defeated me. So I'm just gonna run this through and see what happens. I've started working on the jig. I've cut out the uh, scrappy bit of wood into little squares. And as I said before, this I've tried to make exactly the same width as the slats. Whereas this axis here, I've made slightly thinner for the functioning of the jig, as we shall see in a moment. Now, I thought I'd be able to use this piece of MDF here. I was going to say, the great advantage of MDF is it's flat. But that's not true. The advantage of MDF, if it has any, is perhaps that it is smooth, but this particular piece here has a bow to it, so that's not good for what I want. However, I have this old tatty piece of melamine face chipboard, and that is not quite as smooth, but flat. This is the stop block I set up for cutting those jig squares out, and I'm now going to cut the real thing out. As carefully as I could, I've put that stop block so that it's exactly the same as this width here, so that I create squares. The little jig squares I cut out, this was slightly thinner stock, so they're accurate in one dimension, but slightly shorter in the other, and they're also slightly thinner. And as I keep saying, we'll see the reason for that in the jig in a moment. But now I want to cut out the real squares, which will be exactly square. And the trick is to cut off all these bits here to form those squares so that when I've done it, I'm left with enough lengths of 325 to form the main slats. I've also got a scrap piece of wood here behind the workpiece in order to try to minimize tear out. Of course, I'm going to have to advance it a little bit each time, so I'm going to perhaps run out. We shall see. Laying out the template here, the thinner squares are the part of the jig. They're thinner because the weight's going to go down on here, and I want the weight to weigh on the real work pieces. The grain of these small pieces is the accurate width, so the grain is facing this way where it's spacing out these workpiece squares, but the workpiece squares are facing the other way. Uh, I want this dimension here to be slightly narrower because of course when I glued all this up I have to remove the shelf uh, leaving these squares behind and I don't want them binding on the edges here I just want them locating the workpiece squares. I've also chamfered these little jig squares here in the corners again to try and prevent squeeze out gluing the workpiece to the template. I've nailed down one runner here to stabilize that side I'm now just setting up a right angled runner here to stabilize the other side. And I've left this overhanging slightly here because there will be a clamp coming in from here when the glue up is done. Well, if you can hear it, I apologize for the sound of the rain. It won't stop and I must get on. Uh, normally, Making a thing like this, you would use the brad nailer. Very convenient, and one of its most important qualities is the nail moves so fast that that plus the inertia of the workpiece means it doesn't move. If you were to nail these bits down by hand or screw them down by hand, they would slither around. Same thing with glue. But these are so light that they were in fact moving. 
So I had to glue these outer ones, these buttons at the edges are already pinned on, I had to glue these outer ones and I had to put a call here. I found a bit of wood with a gentle curve like that and I'm going to be using this call to clamp up the workpiece anyway, although I need to move this a bit more this way. And then with that there, those glued down there, I was able to start pinning these down. So I can steady one corner and then fire a couple of brads in. Quite short brads. One of the difficulties with this kind of glue up is squeeze out. So I'm putting some of this low tack tape down made by 3M. I think it's called magic tape in this country. Rather than scotch or sellotape, this will come off more easily if I do get a lot of squeeze out and have to take it up and put it down again. The squeeze out will be here where the slats meet the little squares. I do a dry fit first as there is a little bit of variation in the thicknesses of the squares and the spaces. And then you have to work fairly quickly and with a brush to glue up. I'll be sanding the ends off so I'm not too worried about the exact squareness of here. <coughs> Well, you get the idea. This is my curved call. The idea of a curved call is that as you clamp the ends in, the center is also Transmitting some force. Squeeze out doesn't look too bad. Now, just try and get that down flat again. I was originally going to put a weight on here, but by the time you've got to here, the glue here is grabbing so hard anyway that a weight wouldn't do anything. You just have to push it down as you go. Next I'm going to tidy up these edges here on the crosscut sled and then I was going to bind the edges and do the standoffs in this uh, hardwood here but the client says no so I'm going to cut a few more strips off a bit more of this pine and edge it with that. Made a bit of a mistake. I was calculating this to be wide enough for the length of an A4 sheet of paper and I should have left a little bit more room for the standoffs which will hold each shelf away from each other shelf. But some nice edging will sort that out. I've put a piece of tape across the old kerf here and recut it because this blade is a slightly narrower blade than the old one. And I want to get this placed pretty exactly for where it's going to trim these ends off. Well, I'm not sure it looks any prettier, but I'm in the process of adding some edging here. And uh, one of the things I've learnt over the last few months watching other videos is the importance of a marking knife. So, for example, just square up on this corner here, make a nick here, hold the knife in, 
put the square against the knife, make a gentle cut, now go deeper, and you have something to guide your saw cut. The shelves are done and edged. The next thing to do are these standoffs here, which will hold the shelves apart from each other. I want to use standoffs rather than solid sides for reasons of light, both weight and illumination. And so I'm going to have to cut some accurate 20 degree bevels here on quite a few pieces of wood. The most accurate way I can think of to bevel a piece of wood is with a tilted blade on the table saw. I've tilted the blade 20 degrees. I want to get about two inches or five centimeters separation between the shelves and I'm hoping I shall get that out of this piece of wood here. So we're going to cut a bevel on each long edge <clears throat> and then we're going to chop it into the standoffs that we want. Final assembly has arrived. I've made all the standoffs here. The difficult thing gluing these standoffs is of course gravity with wood glue at either end of these standoffs is going to have the whole thing sliding down. I did think of making a complicated jig to hold it all in place but I've decided just to stay simple and do one shelf at a time. I've clamped a couple of temporary battens across there that'll stop the standoffs sliding down on the glue. I've beveled these back edges here. Eventually there will be some strips of wood running up here to stop all the paper just simply sliding out the back. And temporarily I have these two set squares here holding things from sliding out. And uh, the bottom shelf, of course, also needs to be counted up at 20 degrees. And I've cut a couple of wedge-shaped pieces here to act as feet at the bottom.